Hello class. Well, I'm going to teach from a little different position this week. We have a beautiful fire on behind me. I hope I don't get too hot while we are talking. But I hope all of you are well, and our family is. And so we're going to talk about hope for the journey ahead. And our text comes from Psalm chapter 16. So if you have your Bibles, you want to open to Psalm chapter 16. We're going to do one other lesson in this particular series on learning the art of suffering, because next week I do want to talk about the coronavirus, because I've had people ask the question, is this a sign of the end times? And so I thought, well, let's talk about that. That will be my last lesson in this series, and then we're going to start the book of Daniel, chapter 7. So let's ask God just to bless our time in our study. Father in heaven, I thank you for the privilege of teaching. I pray, God, that you would be with me. May your spirit speak, God, through this video to people, even those who may not know you as Lord and Savior. But I pray, Lord, that all of us can find a sense of hope through this. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. There was a time when honeybees were building a nest around our house in the backyard. And there were hundreds and hundreds, if not over a thousand, honeybees flying around, and they simply were not welcome guests at our house. So we called an exterminator, and the exterminator came and poured some poison into the nest, and one by one, these honeybees dropped to the ground. They just took a nosedive right to the ground. Then I noticed that there was one of the bees, probably the queen bee, that was lying on her back and her legs were kicking, and there was another bee that was flying around that came and actually picked up that honeybee and carried it off. And I thought that was an amazing thing to watch. And what it taught me was that in the kingdom of the bees, there's not only a sense of death, but there's a sense of hope. So our lesson today features hope in the midst of a crisis. Hope for the journey ahead. Many of us are familiar with the story of King Saul and his 3,000 soldiers who were in hot pursuit of David. Saul was very jealous of David because David was more popular than he was and Saul thought the time would come when he would be dethroned and David himself would become king. So because of this jealousy, Saul gets 3,000 of his men together and decides, I am going to put an end to David. I am going to take his life. So when we look at Psalm chapter 16, we're going to see David's reaction to all of this. But first, let's tell the story, because the story comes from 1 Samuel chapter 26. The story goes like this. Saul and his men had camped for the night in the wilderness of Zeph, without having any idea they were in the proximity of their prey. David was in the immediate area. He and Abishai, the brother of David's captain, Joab, were out on a fact-finding mission when they witnessed Saul and his men settle down for the night. When it was dark and Saul and his men were asleep, David and Abishai snuck up on them and stole Saul's sword, which was embedded in the ground by his head. They also took Saul's water bottle lying nearby. Abishai wanted David to kill Saul right there on the spot. Get it over with, he told David. We will never have to run and hide again. But notice David's reply. 1 Samuel 26, verse 9. Do not destroy him. For who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? So David spares Saul's life. Now the two of them made their way across the valley to a hilltop, and when daylight came, Saul was awake. And David shouted toward Saul's camp, holding in one of his hands the sword of Saul and in the other his water bottle. He taunted Abner. Abner was Saul's right-hand man. He was his bodyguard. And David says, hey, Abner, look at me like you are not a very good bodyguard. I was standing right beside your king while you were asleep and snoozing away. Next time you might want to watch your backside and your king's too. Saul was startled. He did not expect to hear the voice of David. And so he called out, David, 
Is that you? And David replied, Yes, it's me. Then he asked Saul, Why are you chasing me? What have I done to you? You are trying to spill my blood as God is witness. Think of it. You, the king of Israel, mobilizing your forces against me, a mere flea. I think it's interesting how David refers to himself. He's talking about Saul as the king, and he speaks of himself as a mere flea. Why are you trying to spill my blood? What am I to you? I am but a mere flea. Saul confessed his sin. He tells David to go home, stop running for his life. He said to David, Today you spared my life. I have played the fool. I am ashamed of myself. It is time for me to return the favor. So as we said, that story comes out of 1 Samuel chapter 26. Now like David, we as Bible-believing Christians are finding ourselves more and more in retreat against a liberal academia, news media, and politicians who want to destroy our faith. We are now being accused of spreading this virus that has quarantined our nation. It is all our fault. We evangelicals are now being blamed for the spread of the virus. And notice this in an op-ed section in the New York Times, March the 27th, where evangelicals were blamed for the spread of the coronavirus. The author of the article was Catherine Stewart. And the article was entitled, The Road to Coronavirus Hell Was Paved by Evangelicals. Her article was filled with undue condescension and mockery of Christianity that is becoming the norm among our mainstream media elites. Here's what Stewart wrote. Religious nationalism, that is those who put God and country first, so it's religious nationalism has brought to American politics the conviction that our political differences are a battle between absolute evil and absolute good. When you're engaged in a struggle between the party of life, that is the pro-life movement, probably referring to the Republican Party, and the party of death, as some religious nationalists now want to frame our political divisions, you don't need to worry about crafting a careful policy based on expert opinion or analysis. In other words, what Stewart is saying is this. We as evangelicals are the moralists who trust in a God to know what is right and what is wrong while we ignore the scientists and the experts who know what is really best for us. In the article, she then singles out the Louisiana pastor who gave out handkerchiefs to a large congregation in defiance of the governor's orders against large gatherings as her example of how evangelicals are spreading the virus. She did not mention, interestingly, the Reverend Rodney Howard Brown, a charismatic pastor of a mega church in Tampa, Florida, who was also arrested for holding services in his church. Now, understand the teaching of Rodney Howard Brown. Brown. He believes that Christians should never get sick. Therefore, this virus cannot possibly touch them. If a person is faith-centered and spirit-filled and they rebuke this virus, then this virus cannot harm them in any way. So, everybody who is faith-filled, they're going to gather for an assembly. And so, Rodney Howard Brown is not going to close down his church. But... The law said otherwise. So both he and the Louisiana pastor were arrested for unlawful assembly. Now, I by no means are defending these two pastors who, in their foolishness, are making a decision as they have. But to blame all evangelical Christians for the nationwide spread of the coronavirus as though all evangelical pastors are holding worship services in violation of the law shows the extent the liberal media will go to put down Christians and make us a subject of ridicule. So we see we're, at least in some quarters, and that op-ed in the New York Times, we as evangelicals are being blamed for the spread of the virus. But over the past couple of weeks, I've had some emails and 
uh, from people who have talked about a uh, bioweapon and that this coronavirus was actually manufactured in Wuhan for the purpose of shutting down the church on a permanent basis, and they wanted to know, what was my opinion about that? Well, I do not believe that to be the case. I do not believe that that was the fundamental purpose for this virus at all, if in fact it was manufactured. I'm not going to get into that. That's not where I want to head with this. But the idea of trying to shut down the church, it's very interesting what has happened during this time when we have not met as an assembly. Bible sales have increased 21% in the last month. And more people around the world are hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ than ever before. They are turning on YouTube and they are listening to preachers here in the United States preach the gospel, even in countries where there is a communist, atheistic leadership. More people today are hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ than ever before. When the church has been shut down, God has taken something that is very negative and he's turned it into something very positive. Well, let's look at Psalm 16 because I want to talk about the hope for the journey ahead. We've already given the story from 1 Samuel chapter 16, uh, from 1 Samuel chapter 26. We've given the story upon which Psalm chapter 16 is now based. And so this psalm then is born out of David's hope for the journey ahead as he's being chased by King Saul. So how do we find hope for the journey ahead? Here's the first thing I want us to remember. We need to remember who God is. That's the first eight verses of Psalm chapter 6. And in remembering who God is, we need to see God as a person who desires our good. We need to see God as a person who desires our good. Here's how the psalm begins. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my goodness is nothing apart from you. So when David focuses on who God is, he remembers all the blessings that have been given to him by God. When we face the crises of life, we need to focus our mind on God's goodness and reflect on the blessings God has given to us. I remember the old hymn, which we've not sung in years, Count Your Many Blessings. Name them one by one. That's exactly what we need to be doing at a time like this. Stop focusing on the negative. Stop getting fearful and begin to count the blessings that God has already given you. That makes me want to look at Psalm 103. Psalm 103 is one of the great psalms of David. And David says this. Here's how it opens. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So, we're being asked to bless the Lord. Now, the question is, we understand how God has blessed us, but how do we bless the Lord? That's the question. And David gives answer. We bless the Lord by remembering all his benefits. We bless the Lord by remembering all the blessings that he has given to us. We bless the Lord when we count our blessings and name them one by one. And that's exactly what David goes on to do in this psalm. For example, David says, uh, He forgives all your iniquities. Verse 3. He heals all your diseases. Verse 3. He redeems your life from destruction. Verse 4. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Verse 4. He satisfies your mouth with good things. Verse 5. He renews your youth like the eagles. Verse 5. He executes righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Verse 6. He makes his ways known to mankind. Verse 7. He is merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in mercy. Verse 8. He will not keep his anger forever, nor has he dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities, verses 9 and 10. Stop and think about that. God will not hold his anger on us forever. 
Rather, he deals with us not according to our sins. He's not even going to punish us according to our iniquities. In other words, we deserve far more of God's wrath and far more of God's punishment than what he's willing to give because God is merciful and gracious. These are some of the blessings that we need to be counting in a day like this. Then David goes on to say, we pick up in verse 11. We're still in Psalm 103. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers us as dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments and do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. And then David closes off this psalm. This is Psalm 103 by saying, Bless the Lord, O my soul. So when David is running for his life from King Saul, what's on his mind? It is not, where is God in all of this? It is not, why am I in this situation? He was not focusing on the difficult times he was going through, but he says, I am going to put my trust in the Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from Him. So it does us no good to focus on the negative, the bad, the evils of life. In good times and in troubled times, we need to trust in God and remember all His benefits. So we're talking about finding hope for the journey ahead. And we're saying, first of all, we need to remember who God is. And then, in remembering who God is, remember that he is a person who desires our good. Another thing we learn, verse 3, Psalm chapter 16, we need to see God in his people. We need to see how God operates through his people for our good. David puts it like this. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. So during the time that David was on the run, David had many dedicated friends who put their lives on the line to help protect him. He was profoundly moved by the thought of their help and their generosity. When my late wife Jackie was going through the throes of cancer, it was unbelievable the support that we received from godly friends in our church. They provided meals cleaned the house, sat with her during her weakest hours when I had to be somewhere else. They flooded us with cards and flowers. They came by to pray for her. Never had we experienced such an outpouring of love. How grateful we were for a fellowship of godly support from God's people in our time of distress. It reminded me of those words of John. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So we're talking about remembering who God is, and we've seen that God is a person who desires our good. We've seen that God also works through his people to help us in difficult times. But the third thing I want you to see from our text here. We need to see God in his present provisions. How God is willing to provide for us right now in this difficult crisis. And there are two things we learn from our text. First, by refusing to compromise in hard times. Notice verse 4 of Psalm 16. David writes, Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. So when David was fleeing from King Saul and his men, 
His journey took him from times in foreign lands where he would encounter the idols of the Ammonites and the Philistines. And while seeking refuge among the Philistines, he refused to raise his hand to Dagon, their chief god. While he was in Ammon, he refused to bow to Molech. He would offer them no sacrifice. In fact, he says, I'm not even going to mention their name. I'm not even going to think about Dagon or Molech. What good could those gods of brass or wood or stone be to me, he thought. They can't speak, they can't hear, they can't feel. They have no ability to know what is going on in my life. So why should I put my trust in dumb idols? He says, I'm not even going to mention their names. I think there's a lesson we can learn here. Our society is trying to bend us, break us, and cause us to bow before their gods. The congregation of the godless are trying to get us to conform to their ways. They use mockery. They use intimidation to tear us down. They even blame us for spreading the coronavirus. They offer us their secular, godless techniques, their new age methods of meditation, their psychics, their self-help speakers, their drugs, all to get us through a crisis. And if we are wise... We will be like David because they, that is the world, offers us worthless answers. True faith is meant for tough times. True faith is meant for tough times. So David is saying, even when I'm among the Moloch and Dagon worshipers, I will not bow to their gods. My trust is in the Lord. He is the only one who can get me through this. So if we want to expect the, the present provisions of God, what David is saying, I need God's help now. I'm not going to turn to false gods. I'm not going to turn to secular uh, theories. I'm going to keep my trust in the true God. Now here's the second thing. If we want God's present provisions, be relying on God in hard times. Now David says this, beginning at verse 5. You are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the right seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I shall not be moved. I want you to notice what God, or what, rather what David is saying about God. There's five things here. This is why David could put his trust in God. First of all, you are a God of comfort, he says. David acknowledges that God, you, are the portion of my inheritance in my cup. You see that in verse 5. You, God, are the portion of my inheritance in my cup. Yes, you, God are the possessor of all things, and therefore, when I am in a crisis, you provide for all of my needs. I never need to be in want. You give me my inheritance from your bounty, and my cup literally overflows. How comforting to know that you, God, will provide for me in my time of need. Aren't you glad that our God is a God of comfort when we are in the worst of situations? God is going to meet your needs. Notice next, not only is God a God of comfort, that's why we can put our trust in Him, He is a God of circumstances. You maintain my lot, says David. Now the word lot refers to David's circumstance at any given time. Regardless of his circumstance, whether he's on the run or hiding in a cave, God knows exactly where he is and the situation he is faced with at any given moment in time. He is a God of circumstances. He knows my lot. One of my favorite hymns contains this line. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Aren't you glad that God knows your lot so you can say, it is well with my soul? Well, David is telling us why he can put his trust in God. 
and in putting his trust in God, he knows that God is going to provide for his present situation. He sees God as a God of comfort. He sees God as a God of circumstances. You know my lot. And then you, God, are a God of contentment. Notice this, verse 6. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. Now, what are these fallen lines? When David looks back over his life, he comes to realize that overall, things have gone very well for him. He's lived a good life. Oh, yes, he was guilty of horrendous sins like adultery and murder and lying and I guess you named them. But he repented and God showed mercy and grace. And still, in spite of these sins, because of God's mercy and grace, God was good to him. And he can look back over his life and realize that. How about you? Have the lines of life fallen for you in pleasant places? As I look back over my life, in spite of occasional hard times, in spite of being once fired from a church, in spite of losing my wife from cancer, I've been truly blessed. I've been blessed with godly parents who raised me to know the Lord. I've been blessed with a good education. I've been blessed with the calling of God on my life. I've been blessed twice with beautiful, godly, supportive wives. I've been blessed with wonderful children who all know the Lord and grandchildren who all know the Lord except for one, and we're praying for him. Again, as stated earlier, instead of focusing on the negative of the moment with this coronavirus, we have been given some time to reflect on and to count our many blessings. That is a good thing. In doing so, you find that God is a God of contentment even in hard times. Aren't you glad? When you look back on your life, you see that your lines have fallen in pleasant places. Then again, we're talking about why David could put his trust in God. He says, God, you're a God of comfort. You're a God of circumstances. You're a God of contentment. Now he says you're a God of counsel. Notice verse 7. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. The prophet Isaiah refers to the coming Messiah as wonderful counselor. And of course that Messiah is Jesus and he can counsel us because he totally understands us. He faced everything in life that we have faced. He knows temptation, ridicule, mockery, rejection, poverty, sickness, grief, and death. And as we talked about in our lesson last week, this verse from the book of Hebrews. It's Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. In talking about our Lord, it says, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Remember, I taught you something last week, hopefully. I want to review that with you right now because it's a great truth. Remember, the writer of Hebrews is saying, that Jesus was tempted, that Jesus suffered, and therefore he can come to the aid of those of us who are in temptation and suffering. And that word that is translated aid from the Greek is the word boethia. It's a compound word, meaning it's two words that come together. You have the word boa, meaning to shout, and you have the word theo, meaning to run. And so it is that when we face temptation, when we face suffering, Jesus totally understands. And when we shout, help, he comes running to our aid. And the counsel that he gives us is wise counsel. He is the all-wise God, Paul says. He never sleeps, nor does he slumber. Day or night, you can approach him. He's available 24-7. And as if you ask him for wisdom, he will give it to you liberally and without reproach. James 1.5. Isn't it wonderful to know that you and I have a wonderful counselor who is God in the flesh. Who is all wise and who understands every situation in which you and I find ourselves. Well, we're talking about why David could put his trust 
in God while he's running for his life. He can put his trust in God because he sees God as a God of comfort, a God of circumstances. He knows our lot. He's a God of contentment. He, he is able to bring blessings to our lives. And when we look back, we can see that our lines, those blessings, have fallen in pleasant places. He is a God of counsel. And finally, he's a God of confidence. Verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, and I shall not be moved. Now the phrase right hand speaks of God's power. With God at our right hand, there is nothing that can stop us. When my uh, wife Jackie was going through her chemo treatments, a lady from the church wrote her a beautiful letter. Included in it was a verse of scripture from Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. And every single day that she had the strength to do so, she read this verse and claimed this verse. Here it is. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Every time she read that verse, she reached out her right hand and said, Hold on, God. I have no fear, for I know you are my help. You may say, how do I know this? I preached this very sermon with a few modifications in her presence when she was sitting on the front row. And then she would say this to me. Here we are sitting on the couch in the family room. And she had just claimed this verse. She had reached out her right hand and said, God, hold on to me. And here's what she said. This is word for word. I feel the presence of God like I have never felt before. It is as though God is sitting beside me and holding me. It is as though he has wrapped his arms around me. And she felt such a sense of peace and such a sense of assurance and such confidence at that moment. She knew she was dying. I'm sitting right next to her. I didn't sense any of that. But God was comforting her at a time like that. And therefore, she could put her trust in God. She could find confidence even in the midst of dying. She died about four months after I preached this sermon. Well, when David was running for his life through foreign territory, he saw the idols of the Philistines and the Ammonites. He would not even mention the name Dagon or Molech because he realized that idols could not help him at a time like this. They would do him no good. He knew who his God was. The only one true God, a God who gave him comfort. A God who knew his circumstances. A God who gave him contentment. A God who gave him counsel. And a God who gave him confidence. We're talking about hope for the journey ahead. And we're gonna, if we're going to have this hope, the first overall theme that I want to get to your mind is we need to be remembering who God is. And then begin to count all the blessings that God has given to us. But remember who God is. That's the first eight verses of Psalm 16. Now let's look at verses 9 through 11. We need to be rejoicing in what God will do. So if we're going to find hope for the journey ahead, we need to be rejoicing in what God is yet to do in our lives. David now acknowledges that while God protected him from King Saul and saved his life, the day will come when he will die. David knew that death was going to come someday. So he closes off this psalm by acknowledging the hope that uh, is his when that particular time comes. Now there are three things now that he emphasizes in these closing verses of Psalm 16. Knowing that death is coming at some time, we need to be rejoicing in the reality of an afterlife 
with the Lord. Notice what he says in verses 9 and 10. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol. You will not leave my soul in the grave. There's life after death. David knows that. Now, how did David know this? Or how do we know he knew this? Well, there's a tragic and hopeful story about the first child born to David and Bathsheba. The child was conceived in an adulterous relationship, and the child was born with illness. And during the time that the child lived, about seven days, David fasted and wore sackcloth, and he mourned and pleaded with God to save his life to save the life of his son. Yet the baby died. Then David arose and dressed, anointed his body with oil, and ended his fast. And he calls for a banquet. Seeing the grief he had endured while the child was alive, all the servants could not understand his acceptance of the child's death. They wanted to know why he was behaving the way he was. Everything seemed so opposite of what it should be. He mourned and fasted while the child was alive, yet he celebrated and held a banquet once the child died. Here is David's explanation. You find it in 2 Samuel chapter 12, beginning at verse 22. David is explaining to his servants why he can act the way he is now. He says, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. What David is saying is, my child went to be with the Lord. And when I die, I too will go and be with the Lord. And when I see the Lord, I will see my son again. He cannot come back to me now, but the day will come when I can go and be with him. David knew there was an afterlife. He was not going to spend eternity in the grave. He was not going to have his soul remain in Sheol, but he was going to be in the presence of God with his loved ones who had gone on before him. So David believed in an afterlife. We need to believe that when this life is over with, there's something better on the other side for those of us who believe in Jesus. That's hope for the journey ahead. So be rejoicing in the reality of an afterlife. Secondly, be rejoicing in the resurrection of the Messiah. David here is prophesying the resurrection of the coming Messiah. Notice what he says, latter part of verse 10. And you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. David never refers to himself as your Holy One. That would simply be out of character with David. Remember, we talked about earlier in this message, how David refers to himself as a flea. Here is King Saul, and he's saying, Saul, you're the king. I'm just a flea. Why are you trying to spill my blood? So David would never think of himself as your Holy One. In fact, we know it's a reference to the Messiah because Peter states that in the sermon that he gave on the day of Pentecost as recorded in Acts chapter 2. He refers to the Holy One. He's quoting from, da uh, from Psalm 16. He's quoting these words of David. And he's referring to the Holy One as Jesus Christ. Yes, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the fundamental hope for mankind. And Paul made that very clear. He said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith also is empty. Yes, Regardless of your lot in life, regardless of what circumstance you may be in now, if there is no Christ, there is no hope. Whenever we put our hope in Christ and believe in his resurrection, then we have the assurance that 
We have something that the world knows nothing about. We possess a hope the world knows nothing about. Jesus put it like this, because I live, you shall live also. David knew his resurrection was based on the resurrection of the Messiah. There is hope even when your journey leads to the grave. But here's the third thing I want you to see. Not only do we need to be rejoicing in an afterlife with the Lord, we need to be rejoicing that the Messiah came, died for our sins, and rose again from the dead. And because of his resurrection, there is a resurrection promise to us. But thirdly, verse 11, we need to be rejoicing in the rapture of the believer. Notice what verse 11 says. You will show me, you God, will show me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Once again, David is looking into the future. He's looking at a time when uh, all believers will uh, have a perfectly intimate relationship with the Lord. Now, there's only two ways by which that can possibly happen. One is by death, or the other is by the rapture. In talking about death, what Paul says is this, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul suffered a lot. He was persecuted. I remember he had this thorn in the flesh, so he was in pain most of the time. He said, if the Lord wants me to stay here, I'm going to continue ministering even in this difficult situation. But I would rather go and be with the Lord. That's gain to me. And then uh, he also said to be absent from the body means to be at home with the Lord. So death is one way by which we come into the presence of God where we are going to find joy forevermore. But the other way is by rapture. When Christ comes for his church and rescues us from the great tribulation that is coming on the earth, then we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air with those who have died first. Those who died first are caught up first. Then we who are alive will be caught up together with them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning at verse 16. Notice, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Notice we're going to be caught up. That's the word for rapture. And thus we shall ever be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. So if I died today, I know that I would have immediate to thrill of entering into the presence of God, where David says there's fullness of joy. On the other hand, if God chooses to let me live until Christ comes in the air for me and all of the saints, I will experience the same thrill. Be it by death or by rapture, we come into the presence of the Lord and experience, as David said, the fullness of joy. At the same time my late wife was dying of cancer, a dear friend of mine, Arlo Collum, who was uh, just a couple of years older than myself, was having a horrific battle with cancer. Doctors told him there was no cure for the type of cancer that he had. Large blood clots formed in his body. Twice a day he had to stick a syringe in his stomach for self-medication. He had countless chemo treatments at the City of Hope in Duarte. Nothing had helped put the cancer in remission. As one last hope, they drilled a hole in his chest and placed a tube that went to the center of his body from where more powerful doses of chemotherapy were injected. It was designed to attack the most aggressive spread of this disease. Arlo got so sick and weak through these injections that he was in bed for weeks at a time after each injection. Arlo was a man of great faith in God. 
He used his cancer to witness to the doctors and all the country club friends who had seen no need for God in their lives. He said to me, Ron, I believe from all eternity past, God has numbered my days. I will not live one second beyond what God has ordained for me. I have told my doctors and all of my friends, whenever God calls me home, I'm ready. Then he would add this, are you ready? Yes, Arlo was a great man of God who in my presence never once questioned God for all that he was going through. In all my years in the ministry of visiting people in the hospital, I never saw a man go through what he went through in his battle with cancer. I was with my wife from beginning to end in her battle with cancer. But I'll tell you, she suffered, but nothing, nothing like what Arlo went through. He asked me to do his funeral, for which it was a privilege to do. He said to me, Ron, preach the gospel. Let my unsaved friends know that when I leave this body, I will be home with the Lord. If my friends want to see me again, they better come to know Jesus. Even though Arlo's body was full of cancer and racked with pain, he knew there was hope for the journey ahead. And so there is for all of us if we just put our trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because regardless of what we're going through now, hey, there is hope for the journey ahead. And that journey ahead ultimately leads us, as David said, to the fullness of joy. Amen.